Hey everyone! Welcome to church! Morning! Morning everyone from the Oliver household. Welcome to Sudbourne and Tunstall Baptist Church, now a virtual church. Good morning and welcome to Sudbourne and Tunstall Baptist Church. My name is Dave, I'm the minister here and it's great to have you with us for another of our online services. At the beginning of the service I've got a few notices, please do pray for us, particularly this week as we consider the future, as we consider how to best move forward giving the existing restrictions and possible new restrictions that might be coming our way. Please pray that we as church officers, um, as we meet this week, would have wisdom and we would make good decisions. Thinking about COVID, but also thinking further ahead about our life coming out of lockdown. Please pray for us. Please pray for us in your own individual prayer life, but also please do join with us for prayer, if you can, in our small groups um, that are happening during the week and in our church prayer meeting on Friday night. It would be great to have you with us at those. Next Sunday, we've got another online service, all being well, um, half past 10 on YouTube, on our website and on our Facebook page. And we will be planning again a live service over at Sudburn at half past 10, same time. Very similar service, um, there's slight differences. Um, but in the main, the same sort of thing is going to be sung and um, considered as part of our studying of God's word. Um, thankfully, the latest COVID restrictions do not apply to churches and what we do. And so we're very pleased that we can continue to meet um, live as well as online. If you'd like to be included in the live services, please let Matt know. It would be lovely to have you there. If you're a regular in the church or if you're fairly new to the church here, you're equally welcome. Um, so if you want to be involved, please let Matt know. And if you're not sure of Matt's details, look on the notice sheet um, that's on our website or contact me and we can sort you out. Please let us know so we can plan accordingly. Sunday Club and Mini Clubbers will be happening next Sunday as well, all being well. Um, we are so glad that um, we can work with our children and include our children in what we do as a church. But now to the matter in hand this morning, our worship of God. Let me just remind you of why we're here. If we are Christians, we can meet together, but primarily with God, because we have been saved by Jesus. It's not because we're particularly good. It's not because we've reached a certain standard in this last week. It's because of Jesus. It's all because of Jesus. If we are Christians, we have been shown the most amazing forgiveness, love, compassion, which leads to acceptance by God into his family. And that is something that every single person on the planet needs. And that's the theme of our first song. Everyone needs compassion, the kindness of a saviour. Let mercy fall on me. This is a prayer. Lord, shine your light and let the whole world see the glory of Jesus and the forgiveness he offers us acceptance into God's family. Let's sing together. Everyone needs compassion.
before him. Our Father, it is our prayer that you would shine your light, that the light of Jesus, the light of the gospel would shine out in this world. But before that can happen, Father, we need to be illuminated ourselves. We need to have Jesus shining into our, our lives. We've experienced this in the past, many of us, but we pray this morning that as we meet together, as your Holy Spirit moves in us, and as we open up your word and we study it, the light of Jesus, the light of the world, would shine in us and out of us as we go from here. Father, please would you be near to us now and be glorified as we worship you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got another one of our Faith in Kids videos to watch together now. We've been watching these. They show us basically why we need Jesus. Um, they're taken from stories from Matthew's Gospel. And this is a particularly important story that we're looking at this morning. Why do we need Jesus? We need new life. And that's something that Jesus can bring. Have a watch of this. Once there was a man who really needed Jesus. He was an important man, but he came to Jesus on his knees. My daughter has died. Come and put your hand on her and she will live. He was calling out to Jesus. He needed Jesus to help. No one else could. So Jesus went and the people followed. There among the crowd was a woman who really needed Jesus. She'd been sick for such a long time, 12 whole years. She tried everything, but no one could help her. Her illness meant she had to stay away from others and it was slowly killing her. Only Jesus could help her. She was reaching out for Jesus. If only I could touch his cloak, I will be healed. She reached out her hand. Jesus turned and said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has healed you. Such kindness, such love, such power. Jesus arrived at the little girl's house. He pushed out the noisy crowd and stood by her bedside. Jesus reached out his hand and held the little girl's hand and she got up. Jesus reached into death and brought life. Jesus changed her completely. He gave her new life. Jesus changed her completely. He gave her new life. Jesus can change you completely by giving you new life. Jesus reaches into our world, into our lives, into our sadness into our sin, into our death, and gives us life. We need Jesus, and we can have Jesus with us now and forever.
We need Jesus because Jesus brings life. And our next song explores how Jesus is able to bring us life. It takes us from where Jesus existed for the whole of eternity in heaven and how he came from heaven and became a helpless baby, entering our world, his glory veiled, not to come and lord it over us, but to serve us and to live his life and then give his life so that we might live. Let's worship the servant king together. From heaven you came, helpless babe Entered our world, your glory failed Not to be served, but to serve And give your life that we might live This is our God, this servant us now to follow him, to bring our lives as a daily offering of worship to the servant king. There in the garden of tears, my heavy load he chose to going back to Philippians one last time this morning. Um, we've been studying Philippians um, on and off since well, the end of April. It's taken us a while, but we've now come to the last three verses. And Lorna is going to read to us Philippians chapter 4, verse 21 to 23. Thank you very much, Lorna. Hello, everyone. Sending you love and prayers for the week ahead. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 21. Greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. 
the brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. All God's people here send you greetings, especially those who belong to Caesar's household. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lorna. Now, before we just consider those three short verses together, let's come before God in prayer again. Let's pray to him. Our Father God, we do want to thank you again for Jesus, the God who became man and gave his life and everything to rescue us. We thank you that Jesus is now on the throne of heaven and we can worship him as the risen saviour, the risen Lord, the King of kings. And we pray that you would help us as we continue to do that this morning. We thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit who brings your word to us, who softens our hearts and calls us into your family and then helps us to live for you. We pray that he would be at work in our hearts this morning as we study these last three verses of Paul's brilliant letter to the Philippians together. We pray that you would help us to learn what it means to live as citizens of heaven, to live as your family here on earth. Please would you help us to do this week, to do that this week as we listen to your word, convince us of the importance of it. Convince us of the truth of what we are reading and change us. Help us to obey it. Father, this morning as we meet as a group of your people here, in this place and wherever it is we're watching from. We want to pray for your church in its many different forms around us in the county of Suffolk. Father, we thank you for our brothers and sisters who are meeting in similar ways to this around Suffolk, around this country, around the world. And this morning particularly we want to pray for our brothers and sisters in Leyston. We pray that you would be with them and help them and encourage them as they meet. We pray for the church at Laxfield. We ask that you would be near to them and help them and our brothers and sisters in Cransford as well. For the churches that we have met through the videos that we've watched over the summer, we pray that you would be near to them in their different stages of coming out of lockdown. Some of them have been meeting for a while, some yet to meet, some starting to meet this weekend. We pray that you would be near to them and encourage them and help them. We want to pray for the churches that some of us as individuals have been part of in the past, when we've lived in other parts of the country perhaps. Father, we pray for those churches that you would encourage and build them up. We pray for the churches that are represented in our online gathering We thank you for the fellowship we have with people from other churches in this strange way. And we pray that you would bless them and help them in their church situation. We want to pray particularly this morning for the church at Crowfield. Although it's a church that some of us know very little about. But we know that there are a group of your people who are meeting online this morning. And who are praying for your help and strength and guidance as to how best to reach that village and the surrounding villages. Please would you be with them, small in number, trying to witness for you. Encourage them and strengthen them, we pray. Help them as they hold out the word of life. But Father, we don't just want to pray for your people this morning. We want to pray for our world and in particular we want to pray for our government as they continue their unenviable task of wrestling with this massive problem that threatens to overwhelm them. Please would you be near to them and guide them. We thank you that there are many Christians in Parliament. We pray that you would help them and may they be a a force for good in Parliament and in this this country. Please, Lord, help them. 
We pray for the world. We know the pandemic is not going away anytime soon and we pray for those who are trying to coordinate responses to the pandemic on an international level. We pray for countries who are struggling anyway and now they're having to deal with this as well. Father, we pray for peace. We pray for the virus to be halted. Father, we pray that your kingdom would come, your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we pray you'll be with all, including those we know and love who are fearful and anxious at the moment, who are worried, maybe feeling unwell. Be near to them and strengthen them, we pray. And again, Lord, we pray that you will be with us and help us as we come to read and study your word together. Help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I guess most of us are familiar with the way that apps on our computers and on our mobile devices try to help us out as we are communicating. Spell checks, grammar checks, and now much more increasingly, artificial intelligence trying to predict what we're going to say and helpfully put some words onto our screen before we've even typed anything. Now, technology like this is not new. Back in the early days of emails, signature blocks could be automatically added to messages with a closing statement like, kind regards, and then your name and the address you wanted to include. Before all of that, countless generations were taught how to start and finish a letter. There were forms that had to be observed. Now, it would be easy to dismiss the last three verses of Philippians as an ancient world autofill. You know, an example of first century writing etiquette. It's noticeable as you read through Paul's letters and the other letters in the New Testament that most of Paul's letters, as the same with Peter and John's letters, letters, letters <coughs> excuse me, finish in a similar sort of way. A lot of them mention greetings. Now, perhaps this is what they were taught in Greek classes in the first century Roman Empire. How to end a letter. Include a greeting. Just like we would put lots of love or yours sincerely, yours faithfully, kind regards. In the Greek world, in the Roman Empire, greetings. So, if that's the case, this is going to be a short sermon, isn't it? It's a reminder that little has changed over the last 2,000 years. Sometimes we are guilty of dismissing the first century as full of cavemen and women whose lives were so very different to our own. Actually, when you start looking at the Bible, when you start looking at history about what was going on there, the Roman Empire boasted a sophisticated culture with many of the practices that we are familiar with today. And that's why the Bible is so relevant. People haven't changed. And so the application of these last few verses could be, listen to the message of Philippians. It's for people just like us. People who had formats that were generally accepted for how to write letters. People weren't different then, so what was written to them is applicable to us today. Amen. So let's sing our last song together. You're not getting off that lightly. I think there's a lot more in these last three verses than just a bit of first century writing etiquette. Now I have to confess to getting a little annoyed when people assume that I am saying something just to be polite. Maybe I ask, how are you? They say, good, thank you, when actually they are nothing of the sort. Now, of course, they may not want to tell me how they are, which is fine. But to assume I don't mean the question, well, that's a pity. We mustn't make the same mistake with Paul. Okay, he's writing in a real culture which has certain literary rules. But that doesn't mean he doesn't mean what he's saying. The reason these last verses are here are not merely that they fulfill cultural expectation. They, like all the words that have been inspired by the Holy Spirit, all the words in our Bibles have a really important message. 
And the fact that they come at the end, if anything, adds to their importance. This is what Paul wants us to finish his letter thinking about. Having said that, I'm not about to try and drag anything new out of these verses. Because I think this is like a summary. The headlines of Paul's letter. If Philippians chapter 4 is an application of the main points of this letter, as we've seen over the last two weeks, I think these last three verses could well be Paul pulling everything together. And he pulls them together into two massively important ideas. We're going to focus on the, f- the first one for most of our time, but notice the second one as well. The title of this sermon is Finding Joy in Jesus... And then a summary of these verses, lots of love, Paul. And the two themes that he brings out are greetings and grace. So the title, Finding Joy in Jesus, Lots of Love, Paul. And first up, we get this idea of greet. The word comes three or four times in just two verses. And it's a lovely word, isn't it? Greetings. Maybe you don't know um, how it appears in other versions of the Bible. In the old authorised version of the Bible, the word is translated salute, which sounds a little formal, it sounds a little regimented. Other translations include phrases like give my regards to, say hello to, asked to be, or so-and-so asked to be remembered to you. It's the sort of message that we're familiar with. We see someone and they say, oh, so-and-so says hi. That's what's going on here. There are some personal messages. I love the literal idea behind the word greet. It's like the word hug. It implies enfold them in your arms. When you greet somebody, you hug them. It's the same idea that Paul and Peter use in some of their letters when they say, greet one another with a holy kiss. When Paul is talking about greeting here, He's talking about an expression of sincere love between Christians. And Paul, in these last two, letter, uh, last two verses, wants to unpack this. This is one of the reasons I don't think Paul is merely following, following literary rules. He is still teaching. And he makes four clear points about greeting. And we're going to run through them very briefly, and I'm sure you've noticed them already. The first thing Paul says is greet all. All God's people in Christ Jesus. Now, when Paul says this, it could be Paul is sending his love to all the Christians in Philippi. He might be saying, I'm sending you all God's people my greetings in Christ. But even if that was what Paul was saying, Paul is still urging the Philippians to follow his example. He says that in 3 verse 17, chapter 3 verse 17. Paul is being an example, and what he's saying here is this is what all Christians should do. They should greet all God's people. Paul wants the Philippian church to make it clear to any Christians that they interact with that they love them. And he wants to make it clear that they love them, not because they naturally get on or they never argue or they agree on everything or they always enjoy each other's company, He wants them to show their love because Jesus is their King and Saviour. He says, greet all God's people in Christ Jesus. Jesus is their King and Saviour and example. And because of Jesus, God is Father to them all. He says, this is the reason why you must love each other. You're united by Jesus. If I had a million pounds for every time I had, I've said this, I would be really rich now. But it's really hard to over, overstate the importance of love in the church. If we are Christians, that means we claim Jesus as Lord. That's the simplest expression of what it means to be a Christian. It means we think obeying Jesus is really important. And Jesus, our Lord, commands us to love each other. And in John 13, verses 33 to 35, Jesus says that our love for each other is the key evidence to others that we are his disciples. 
If we're Christians, we have been saved by Jesus, which means we've been adopted into God's family, which means we are brothers and sisters, which should mean we love each other. If we are Christians, we claim to follow Jesus, which means we try to follow his teaching and his example. And of course, he was prepared to sacrifice everything out of his love for us. That is our example. And so we are to greet We are to show love to others. But notice this is not just show love to a few people. Paul's instruction is to greet all God's people. Imagine the implications in Philippi. You've got these two ladies, Euodia and Sintichi, who have been having a bit of an argument. They've fallen out big time when everybody knows about it. Lots of people know about it. And Paul says, Euodia, you are to greet everybody, including Sintichi. And Sintichi, you are to show love to everybody, including Euodia, because you are both in Christ Jesus. But it's not just people who've had arguments. Those people from families who've had arguments in the past and who don't often get on, are to show their love for each other in Christ Jesus. It's common to show your love to your natural families. We see that all the time. But if anything, in the church, it should be more common to be showing more love to our spiritual family. People from different backgrounds, Paul says, are to show love to each other. People from different ethnic groups should show love to each other. People of different types of jobs, whether they be manual or office based or management, etc., are to show love to each other. People who have been Christians for a few days and Christians who have been Christians for decades are to show love to each other. The instruction is, greet, show love to all God's people. The obvious question is how? I've mentioned hugging as a literal translation of the command. (laughs) That gives us a problem, doesn't it? Because it's not allowed at the moment. If this is a case where we as Christians should be obeying God's word and not the law of the land, sorry, is this a case where we should be obeying God's word and not the law of the land? I don't think this is the sort of thing we need to go to prison for or be fined over. The literal term, you see, is not meant to be taken literally. I've been in churches where everyone hugs, but when you speak to individuals in the church, they're constantly whinging and whining about each other. But they've hugged each other, so they think that's all right. They've shown a bit of love. No. Hugging is just an expression that covers all sorts of love. Love includes enjoying and longing to spend time with people. It's a key way we show love. You've probably heard it said, of course, you don't have to be... You don't have to go to church to be a Christian. Actually, in practice, you do. It's not enough to meet with a few of God's people for a coffee. Paul says, show love to all of God's people. And you do that by meeting with all of God's people. And the church gathering is where that takes place. Of course, just being in a church gathering is not showing love. But it's the regular and visible context for showing love. Which is why the current situation with its restrictions on gatherings is so painful, or it should be. How we show love by meeting together regularly as a group of God's people, as a local church. But there are other ways. Missing people when they can't gather, that's a way of showing love, isn't it? When someone is ill, sending the text, oh, we did miss you today, hope you feel better soon. Getting in touch with people you haven't seen for a few weeks. Saying, oh, I do so miss meeting up with you. Hope to see you soon. Bearing with people who are fearful about gathering. Working hard to keep them included is an important way that we show love. Of course, there's much more than just what we do when we gather on a Sunday. Not limiting our relationship with others to whole church gatherings is another way we show love. Meeting with people could be in home groups or prayer meetings. Could be going out with people for coffee, going off on walks together, just a phone call or a text. 
Being aware of other people's needs is a way of showing love. Taking an interest in other people's needs is a way of showing love. Praying for other people, really important way of showing love. Helping other people in their needs, being practical, really important. Working to meet other people's needs, sharing with other people, copying others who you see showing love. All of those are ways that we can greet others, show love to others. Two big ones, encouraging others in their relationship with Jesus. That's the most good we can do for someone. Encouraging them to come closer to Jesus. Encouraging others in their obedience of Jesus. Really important way of showing love. And of course... While we're thinking about all those things, we mustn't forget physically showing that we love people as well. As situations allow by hugs, kisses, handshakes, bumping elbows, or whatever else is culturally appropriate, it should be clear to people in the church that they are loved by us and by everyone else. It should be clear to people outside the church looking in that there is a community of people who love each other. And I could go on. There's loads more we could say here. To which you're thinking, seriously, it's just one word. Greet. Well, yes, it is just one word. But I think this is what Paul is urging us to. To show love to all God's people in the local church. To show love when we first meet up with people and we start talking to them. Make it clear that we're pleased to see them. Some people you talk to and the first thing they say is a negative thing or you know, they're a bit cross about something. What we want is for people's faces to be lighting up when they come together with other Christians because they love them. And by doing that, we show that we are followers of Jesus. This all comes from Philippians. It's by living like this that we will know joy in Jesus. Second greeting. Greet all God's people is the first one. Paul then says, the brothers and sisters who are with me send greetings. And what he means here is all the officers of the church send their greetings. He's talking about the leaders and the deacons who are closest to him in Rome. Paul assures the Philippians of his love for them. He knows them and he's familiar with them. The Philippian Christians are to show their love to each other when they meet and have opportunity. But the church leaders and officers mentioned in chapter 1 verse 1 also want to send their greetings to the Philippian church. And this is what Paul records here. And this is so important. Rome and Philippi were 600 miles apart. That's a very long way. In the ancient world, it would have taken several weeks to take that journey. Practical ways of expressing love over that sort of distance would have been limited. But the leaders, the deacons of the church in Rome, were keen to remind the Philippian Christians that they were interested in what was going on in Philippi and were praying for them. They have a link through Paul and Epaphroditus. And because Paul and Epaphroditus loved Philippi, so the church leaders in Rome took a real interest. And that's a key feature about what church leaders and officers should be like. They should have an awareness of and a prayerful interest in the wider church. Local churches may be independent, but they should not be introspective, inward-looking and isolated. Leaders and deacons of churches should be conscious of the wider church, where the church is defined as the body that preaches the good news about Jesus. Partnership in the gospel is a key Philippian theme. Paul knows the Philippians are truly Christians because they partnered with him in the work of the gospel. And the leaders and officers of the church in Rome are involved in that partnership. But not just in Rome, with the Philippian church as well. So church officers, that's for us, being concerned for the wider church. But notice, it's not just for those with particular responsibilities in the church. Paul then says, all God's people here send your greetings. You see, inter-church fellowship is a privilege and responsibility, not just for the leaders of the church, but for the whole church. Now, of course, Paul is not saying that we are to be involved in and have an interest in every church situation around the world. 
That would have been tough in Paul's day and totally impossible today. Of course, our primary concern has to be the work that God has called us to here. But where we have opportunity, we are to be looking to show love to our brothers and sisters in other places. Let me give you a few examples of how that could work out. Many of us have spent time in other churches before we've moved here. It's good to keep up with our wider church family in those places and to pray for those churches and to highlight the needs of other churches here so we can pray for those churches in our prayer gatherings. We have links to churches around here. Those videos we saw over the summer from other churches, they weren't there just to fill time. They were ways of staying in contact with being aware of what is going on and how we can show love to our brothers and sisters in other parts of Suffolk. Praying for them, rejoicing with them, sometimes weeping with them. You may have noticed we prayed specifically for Crowfield this morning. I've never been to Crowfield, but I know a couple of people who are there and that they're having a tough time, just like the rest of us. So we show love to them by praying for them. Our United Prayer Meeting, so important where we meet up with the church at Laxfield and the church at Layston and the church at Cransford and show love to them as we pray for them. As a group of churches, we have a, an annual conference. It didn't take place this year, but next year, the Foundations Conference. Rico Tice is coming. We hired out a big church in Ipswich. It's a great opportunity to get together and spend time showing love to our brothers and sisters. The Grace Baptist Mission annual meetings next month. It's going to be online in some way. An opportunity to get in touch, to show an interest, to show our love for the church around the world. Our missionaries like Nathan and Urfa Jared in, Javid in Bradford, Alan and Jane Hutt in Kenya, Chris Teasley in First Baptist Church in Crystal Springs, Mississippi. We, as a local church, are in the work of the gospel together with many other local churches. And we need to remember this, as in the church that is here, is not all there is to the church. And we praise God for that. Paul has highlighted the importance of partnership many times in this letter. We will be strengthened as we make time to pray for the work of the church around the world, and we will give and be given joy. One last thing about greetings. Caesar's household send their greetings, Paul says. Now here's a question. Why does Paul single out Caesar's household? Is it that he's quite chuffed that some of the emperor's family are in his church now? He would love to say, you'll never guess who's been coming to our church, but he's a bit more subtle than that. So he just says, Caesar's niece sends her love. Oh, didn't I tell you? Oh, yes, she became a Christian. Isn't that wonderful? I don't think that's what Paul is saying. Well, that would be okay. Household here would include family members, yes, but also employees and palace guards. People who the church would have seen as their biggest enemy. It was the emperor, the Caesar, after all, who was responsible for most of the hardship that the first century church was facing. Paul was in prison in the emperor's palace. The Philippian Christians were suffering under Roman rule. Now, we've already seen how Paul was using his imprisonment to preach about Jesus to the palace guard. And it seemed that some of those who had listened, perhaps the guards who had watched over him, had become Christians. Maybe Paul is saying, be encouraged, Philippians, Jesus is more powerful than all the might of Rome. So it makes absolute sense to hold out the word of life to anyone and everyone. Maybe that's what Paul is saying. Or maybe Paul is saying, all sorts of people can be saved. Be ready to show love to those who at one point were your enemies. Or maybe he's saying both. No one is too bad or weak to be rescued by Jesus. And no one is too powerful or good not to need rescue by Jesus. Everyone needs to be saved. Anyone can be saved. And when they are, we are to love them. Paul finishes with these words. 
which are a blessing. He talks about grace in verse 23. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Paul started with a prayer in chapter 1, verse 2, I think it is, that the Philippians would know grace and peace as a result of his letter. He has written at length about how we can know God's grace, how we can live in peace, or putting them together, how we can find joy in Jesus. A key part of the Christian's joy comes from living as a citizen of heaven on earth. And Paul has told us, we do that by holding on to God's word, by being in a loving community in the church, by striving side by side for the cause of the gospel, by praying together, by serving together, by serving one another, by sharing with each other, by bearing with each other in hard times. In Paul's letter, he's been saying, these are the things we must be doing as Christians. Please note, doing those things does not make us Christians. We're saved by God's grace through Jesus. Our citizenship is in heaven, and that is purely and simply a gift from God out of his grace in Jesus. But as Christians who have been saved by God's grace, God gives us more grace through Jesus via the ministry of the Holy Spirit to get on and live as citizens of heaven. And when we do that, we will know joy, joy in Jesus. Time has gone. God's grace is the answer to all our problems. It saves us and then it enables us to serve. And it's God's grace that will keep us for the whole of eternity. We're going to sing one last song, Amazing Grace. Grace.
to serve Jesus. We pray that you would help us to do that in every area of our lives. And we pray that as we do this, we would know joy. We would find it in Jesus. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with your spirit. Thank you for joining with us this morning. If you've got any questions, any comments, please get in touch. Take care during this week. Serve God. Love each other. I look forward to seeing you soon. Take care and God bless.